All right, here is a FADA um, model 169 uh, tube radio from 1939. This is a fairly large set, tabletop set. There's my hand, and it's quite a bit bigger than than that. I have a pretty good sized hand, so um, anyway. Uh, Surprisingly, this is, well, first of all, let's get into this first. Uh, it is a three-band, um, six-tube radio. And, uh, you have the special broadcast band, which consists of 2.5 megahertz up to 6 megahertz. Uh, they call it special broadcast band. It actually includes the old police band. Uh, some aviation stuff, which is actually still there, but it's side band. Uh, the ham bands, this is amateur, which nowadays stops at 4 megahertz, which is 80 meters, 75 and 80 meters. And um, more aviation, which is actually still there. Uh, but sideband and uh, 40, 49 meter uh, short wave broadcast. So anyway, um, and then it goes from um, what looks like about 8 up to 22 megahertz short wave uh, broadcast. And then your standard AM broadcast. But uh, anyway... Uh, what I was getting to was, uh, this is a transformerless set. It's six tubes, and it's uh, kind of interesting to note that um, it looks like it carries uh, two rectifier tubes, which are 25-volt tubes, and uh, a 25-volt uh, audio output tube, which is a 25L6. It's got two... Uh, 25 Z6 rectifier tubes and uh, this one over here looks like it's gone to air and need to be replaced and um, let's see what else what, what 6 SQ7 6 uh, SK7 uh, the normal uh, normal tubes for a uh, for actually a, a transformer set which are kind of odd too <clears throat> and again, this is a model 169 and uh, there is the tube layout which uh, is a very very small sticker <laughs> I have to kind of get you up real close so you can read it but there is the tube lineup looks like just a, a standard uh, line driven uh, series string set uh, which uh, is uh, 39 is uh, a little on the early side for a uh, for an all-american five but uh, it's what's kind of when they started doing it uh, was the uh, late 1930s just before the war a couple of years before it and uh, so anyway, this is an example, and uh, this tube lineup is not the typical tube lineup you would see in in that you know in a line-driven set. But uh, anyway, uh, saw this for uh, quite a high price. <laughs> I probably paid too much for it, but uh, eh, it was something that was a little unusual, and uh, I went ahead and picked it up, and um, uh, you know. So I thought we would work on it. It uh, looks like it had a uh, back cassette loop antenna, which is missing. But uh, I've got a couple of uh, loop setups that I've scrapped off of junk radio. So maybe we can get something that'll work. Okay, I think the first thing we we should do is replace this uh, 25Z6 uh, rectifier tube. It obviously looks really cloudy inside and looks like it's gone to air I don't think that's any good so I'm gonna go ahead and replace this um, and looking through my junk I did have one 25 Z6 uh, 
tube that I purchased in a lot of tubes and uh, I'm glad I saved it uh, an old Zenith tube from 1958 so anyway so we'll go ahead and put that in there and uh, go ahead and discard that old tube it's no good and uh, I think we'll uh, we'll give her a quick power up and see uh, see what happens I think I'm gonna grab the uh, variac though so I can bring it up a little bring it up slowly and dig it around in this uh, the back of the set I found these old postage stamps that are three cents with the uh, Statue of Liberty on it looks like it's been quite a while since uh, postage stamps were that cheap anyway this one's all rolled up but uh, both the same thing old uh, three cent postage stamps not sure what year those guys would have been from but uh, anyway we got our uh, got our variac hooked up and I think we'll go ahead and bring it up slowly I'm gonna put it up about 40 volts and see what happens probably not much I'll let it sit there for a little while and I'll cut you back on. Alright, so it's been sitting for about 15 minutes uh, with the uh, with it on about 40 volts and I cranked it up to about 60 and we're getting some dim activity here so this is lighting up. The rectifier tubes are lighting up but it's uh, all the tubes are, are lighting up but they're really on the dim side there. Let's uh, go up a little bit more. What are we at? Uh, go up to about 80. getting a little brighter there up to about uh, 90 there about 90 volts there some light down in here so let's see what's going on Make sure there's no smoke or <laughs> anything unexpected happening. I'm starting to hear some static. The dial string on it's broken too. Well, we have activity. Well, I guess it worked. All right, we're up to about 110 volts now. That's pretty good. It's picking up local without even an antenna. Let me uh, let me clip in an antenna and see what see what what, what we get. You don't necessarily okay. need clipped in a little uh, a for, back of set antenna off of a junker radio. We can show you how to do back of set loop. The right way. It and uh, you. we're getting uh, getting well, the signal now. Say her name, but uh, it's light. It's probably creating some interference. So we're getting some activity, so let's. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pull the chassis on it and see what uh, 
what all we're dealing with here at least uh, seems like it works not even getting any, any filter home or anything so that's pretty surprising all right so here we here's the chassis speaker uh, looks pretty good on it uh, be nice if it had some sort of like a felt covering over it keep dirt from getting into the voice coil but anyway it's uh, pretty crusty and spider webby and all that so it's definitely been sitting for quite a while and uh, looks like the uh, dial light is uh, pretty fried looking I didn't see it illuminate and it looks pretty black so I would say it's no good and, uh, it's uh, pretty uh, pretty crammed in there for all of the large components they used the uh, tuning capacitor looks pretty dirty and so I'll need to clean that and all the bearings in it the dial cord is broken on it that's why I had to reach in and tune it from the back so I guess I'm just a glutton for punishment when it comes to broken dial cords it always seems like I end up with something that needs one and, uh, here's the uh, underside of the chassis looks like it uh, has um, some replacement older replacement capacitors and uh, uh, a lot of its original capacitors um, so dog bone resistors and um, Uh, a lot of the uh, these old uh, Bakelite block or not Bakelite block but mica capacitors I don't know why I'm thinking about Philco for some reason I guess but uh, anyway it looks like the uh, filter capacitor has been replaced at some point it looks like one of those Sprague dry electrolytic uh, capacitors they have seemed to hold up pretty good over time I guess this one's no exception I see a date code on it 339 I'm wondering if that's the uh, 39th week of 63 or 53 but uh, either way it's uh, still functioning but uh, I would definitely go ahead and replace that uh, it's uh, old enough and uh, needs to be replaced somebody's hacked in a power cord and didn't tie a knot on it for strain relief and like they just kind of tacked it in on the switch there so that'll need to be addressed and um, re-soldered and somebody even melted the cord there but we'll get to all that anyway uh, let's see there are our antenna wires here coming out of the back and we got some nice spider webs and stuff inside of it so anyway uh, it doesn't look like too hard of a of a job here just uh, needs some attention after sitting for a while and uh, also uh, here's our broken dial string here looks like about three and a half turns here on uh, on the tuning shaft there and uh, the remnants go up through that hole there up to the uh, tuning capacitor all right, so I pulled the uh, front dial off here, which uh, involved those two bottom screws right there. Just two flathead screws. That's actually a pretty heavy piece of metal. And um, went ahead and uh, pulled it off, found our spring laying uh, down here. And the uh, dial string was broken and uh, so I went ahead and pulled it out to get a, a length approximation and I found this piece here which is a fairly new piece of uh, dial string here and it looks about like the original uh, this one's uh, definitely longer than the original but I think it'll give us a good uh, start I always like to get one that's uh, longer than the original and uh, kind of go ahead and string it through go ahead and do our wraps uh, down here and bring it around this one's pretty simple it looks like three and a half turns 
just wraps around here one side of it and the other side wraps through here you, you tie it to your spring and then tension it off here and that's about all there is to it so a nice easy one don't mind doing the easy ones but uh all those other ones that have <laughs> a dial pointer and all that and about five or six wheels it's got to run through all those can be a little challenging all right yep that was definitely a fairly easy one I was glad it was easy so uh, yeah just uh, three and a half turns on the bottom and then over and then over this way and it just uh, hooks to your spring ties off and tie your spring off and keeps tension on it and you're good to go so there you have it all right so I got <clears throat> took it down to the uh, garage and blew out the dust so it looks a lot cleaner get a little bit more light in here but, uh, anyway so the tuning capacitor looks a lot better and um, we got the uh, the new dial string installed and it seems to be working good too so and I also replaced the dial light bulb and it's uh, working now and clean the controls um, this tone knob here was um, quite uh, stiff and uh, was able to uh, to put a little bit of the uh, the uh, electronics cleaner and lubricant in there and it seems to be working good now I had to put a knob on there and work it back and forth a pretty good bit but it seems to be working good now and this uh, this uh, volume off and on knob looks like a replacement somebody replaced that uh, a long time ago and um, so we had to clean that one as well it was pretty scratchy and it was kind of hard to find the the uh, access hole for that one and uh, actually ended up finding it right down in there you probably can't see it on camera but uh, it's on the front side of there there's literally no access from back here at all a lot of times you can get it in where the uh, leads go in but not on this one all right so I test played it for a while and uh, seems to be playing pretty good and um, so I think we'll move into uh, replacing some of these old caps and checking uh, resistors and uh, some of these components in here, these passive components, and uh, seeing what they're what they're like. But uh, uh, as you know, if you watched plenty of my videos before. We generally just go ahead and replace these old paper caps. Are most likely not any good anyway. They're probably very leaky and. This one here looks like it's separating, like the uh, innards are starting to push out of the paper casing here. So we'll just go ahead and replace all these old paper caps here and um, uh, see how it goes. We'll go ahead and replace this filter cap first. But, uh, yep, we'll check back in. All right, so this is a... 50 microfarad, 30 microfarad, 50 is red, and the green is 30 here. So, pretty common value. I need to go in. I'm gonna before I get into too much more of this. I'm going to uh, going to go in and print the schematic. Uh, I was able to pull it up. Uh, last night and uh, briefly look at it so I'm gonna go ahead and print the schematic and make sure that uh, these values are not really that critical when it comes to the to the stuff like the, the these caps these filter caps but um, I'm gonna go in and print the schematic and everything and see uh, what the original values were and uh, we'll try to try to match that as closely as we can all right, so apparently we have 230 mics here, 
and uh, it's a, this schematic is a little confusing here um, because you have these shaded sort of parts here and then you have these that are in bold black lettering you have a shaded here and uh, basically it explains here that uh, uh, parts shown in dotted lines are for 25 cycle operation only so apparently they made some of these radios for 25 cycles back in the day and um, so obviously we're not going to be using these on 25 cycles so these won't even or these won't apply so looks like we had one 16 microfarad which is this replacement here which is a 20 and I'm gonna go back with the same but I'm gonna clean all this crap up here I don't you know they're using all this stuff for a ground and it was kind of sloppy looking work so I'm gonna neaten some of that up and uh, apparently uh, this was to replace the 230s and I'm gonna go back with 233s I'm just gonna go with some small radial electrolytic caps and put them down here and then run them over to a to a, a ground all right uh, if you see this right here this is a a big bunch of mess right here where a bunch of wires come in on this pin here and uh, I'm going to try to try to clean that up and uh, we'll uh, solder our uh, new electrolytic capacitor there that's where the 16 went uh, I don't have a 16 so closest thing I have is a 22 so I'm just gonna go with a 22 they had a 20 on there an old dry electrolytic 20 and uh, I, I have a feeling it's uh, it's pretty dry it's uh, it's checking about 30 something uh, microfarad so uh, I think it's uh, a goner 105.9 in Darlington and worldwide on our free iHeartRadio app All right, so I have uh, gotten most of the caps in the power supply section replaced, um, including all uh, that includes all those electrolytics and the uh, across the line capacitor. Got that replaced as well. It was a typical 0 0.05 uh, capacitor, so we got that one replaced and uh, have a few more to do. Go ahead and unplug that and I'll show you. I got those. They seem to have these caps shunted dire directly to the chassis ground. They had all that stuff hooked up over here so I just moved it to here and uh, cranked up the big iron, the big 200 watt uh, pencil iron I've got here and tacked this one here because there wasn't enough lead to make it over here so anyway uh, looks a little little sloppy but uh, it, it'll get the job done and it's kind of hard to to clean this mess up here because there's so many wires that come to that one pin so we just cleaned it up the best we could and uh, we'll go leave it at that so anyway um, a couple of more of these paper caps I'm just gonna go through and replace these paper caps and uh, Go back and check these uh, dog bone resistors and see if they've gone up in value. One thing that I found about those dog bone is they rarely usually, uh, at least what I've ran into uh, in my work here. And uh, also I put a knot in that cord to to give it some strain relief. I had to undo it from each there and, and then tie it. So anyway, uh, the dog bone resistors typically uh, don't usually go up in value too much, at least the ones I've run into. So but we will check those anyway. So let me get to this and we'll check back in. All right. So we got all the uh, capacitors, and um, I uh, only really replaced one resistor, which was in parallel with that cap there. That's the way it was from the uh, factory, and uh, it's a 
a few days later now and um, resolved a, a few issues here. Uh, this set had no back of set antenna, uh, back of set loop antenna. So we, uh, I found one out of my uh, my junk. This one came off uh, an old RCA clock radio, and uh, it was a little banged up there, but uh, it fit in here. And um, I thought about making, you know, a loop. I mean, I've got a loop, one that actually worked a little bit better than this one, and I may end up going to that one. I'm not really, really sure at this point, but this one for now works, and it actually fits on the existing mount okay and then I just soldered up the wires here to it and I think this is for short wave here and um, so um, I think we're good to go in the electronics and um, everything I'm gonna try to do an alignment on this thing but uh, the uh, schematic didn't uh, detail the uh, the alignment process uh, it referred you to another um, section of whatever I don't know if it was the factory service information or what it was but I haven't been able to locate that information so I may have to do a little more digging and see if I can find see if it's in the Beatmans that I have uh, well, excuse me. Uh, I think this is Riders. It was out of Riders, but uh, anyway, let's see if there's any more information on the alignment procedure out of Riders. And um, I want to try to figure out what the IF on this one is. Uh, it's easy to say it could be 455, but uh, back in the 30s, uh, they were kind of flip flopping around, and it wasn't until sometime in the 40s I think they found common ground and uh, decided to do pretty much uh, make it standard uh, for uh, 455 kilohertz so uh, this one's got some sort of oddballish tubes in it too so it's kind of hard to say if it's 455 or not but uh, either way uh, I need to find that out and uh, so I can do a proper alignment on it uh, don't think there's a whole lot involved with this one um, it does have quite a few variable caps here and um, another one here and I believe this one has to do with the frequency adjustment placement on the uh, on the dial and some of these uh, have to do with the short wave bands so anyway but um, uh, another issue I resolved uh, all, and this is of course another thing off camera I resolved was uh, this case here had no dial glass in it at all and uh, I went down to the garage and uh, I measured this out and cut a piece of glass for it and mounted it in there it's not the most professional thing but uh, I think it will work and uh, it definitely beats uh, no dial glass so we just uh, found some really short screws and um, you know of course I cut my piece of glass out five by five inches and um, then um, found some of these little spring clip deals here that hold the speakers in on some of the newer 60s radios they they kind of just slide over the plastic down over the speaker now if you put a screw and a washer through those things they they hold in the uh, the glass pretty well, so I believe that will uh, suffice uh, as a little bit better dial glass. I think the original one, it had staples in it, so it was probably some sort of flimsy plastic originally that uh, probably either got weathered or cracked or something and was removed by whoever had this radio um, in the past, so anyway we will go with this piece of glass I think it's a better choice and uh, for dial glass anyway and um, will serve the purpose yeah. 
All right, so I thought I would see what condition the tubes are in. And uh, this is our 25L6 uh, audio output tube. It's like about 63 or so. And slowly climbing. I think I might have one that may be a little bit stronger than this. Alright, so I've got this. I think it's a Artic Articus or something like that. I don't know. It's a little bit stronger. Reading 66 and no fluctuation. Whatever brand that is, I'm sure it's made by a national brand. The original was this Raytheon tube here. No codes or anything. Alright, this is the 25L6, uh, one of the rectifier tubes. This is the one we replaced that went to air. It's a Zenith brand tube. And um, factory code 18820. It looks like the 14th week of 58. And it's coming in just barely good. But uh, we'll have to have to use it for now because 25 Z6s are not. Uh, what did I say a minute ago? Probably said another number. It's a 25 Z6. Anyway. Uh, 25 Z6s are not too common in my junk box for tubes, so uh, this one functions and works, so we'll use it for now. I'll go check the other one. Alright, here's a silver tone, uh, the other 25 Z6 rectifier tube, and it's reading about the same. It could be just a tester, I'm not sure. All right, so I switched over tube testers because I have redone the circuitry in this one. Uh, I need to get to that Konar one day and try and check everything in that. It was kind of a, you know, somewhat of a newer tube tester, 70s, so I, you know, haven't really messed with it since I got it. But this one, this is a 6SK7, which is our IF tube. Uh, well, actually, this is one I had in my, my, my stock, and uh, it checks very strong. In the other tester, it was just barely in the green. So I believe for octal tubes, I'm going to start using this 625. All right, so this is the one that was in the set. It's uh, Raytheon, or Raytheon, whatever. It's checking a little weaker in the 600s. About 650 and it's backing up a little bit. It was over closer to 660 Let's see what else we got. I got several of these tubes All right, so here is a Ford Motor Company Tube here probably well most likely out of an old car radio And it's really strong way over uh, about 810 or so so I think I'll go with this one. It's the strongest out of the batch. And I'll give you a little bit better look at it here. There you have it. Alright, so this is the 6SQ7, which is the... Um, First audio driver tube. It's coming up kind of weak. Um, I'll see if I have anything stronger, but I don't have very many of these tubes. So um, let's see what we got. All right, so here's a, a metal a metal six SQ7. A little bit stronger than the other one. Not a whole lot, but a little bit, and um, I don't know if this is just, you know, picky tester or what, but um, 
it seems to me that I remember a lot of these 12 SQ7s do the same thing on some of these meter on some of these testers. They don't really have a very high reading, and uh, you know the settings for the tester. You have to turn the shunt way down on it to like 11 on this one for this tube, and uh, I don't know if it's just uh, you know the the tester or what, but. Um, I'm not crazy about these metal tubes, but I'll go ahead and go with this one since it being the strongest out of the two. Alright, so here's the 6SA7. This is another Raytheon tube. And it was reading pretty good. About 660 there. So nothing wrong with that. Alright, so I got the signal generator fired up and we're putting out a about a 456 kilohertz tone and um, I don't know what I don't know why but uh, I missed this with the big line under it IF peak 456 so and it just says conventional alignment it doesn't really give any specific instructions this thing keeps drifting around a hair and it's close enough to 456 it's not going to make a difference so anyway um yeah 456 anyway um so it just says conventional alignment <clears throat> i'm not gonna really go crazy with this this radio is performing pretty well so i'm just gonna gonna kind of give it a, a basic alignment with these if cans and kind of see what we can do here and maybe tweak some of these if they're antenna tremors uh, maybe try to get up get those adjusted a little bit but uh, yeah, that's about all I'm gonna do it's just a, a generic supposed to be a generic alignment this is marked here with C special section volume 7 and I looked at that part and that's just it's just general instructions to tell you uh, how to do a general alignment on most all radios so we'll just peak them for maximum and I'll set y'all on top of the stapler here and I'm gonna get out my golden screwdriver see what we can do here Sound a little off. Back down that step a little bit. So I need to do a little, uh, a little touch up on the uh, the dial scale here and where it's supposed to be. Uh, this should be 15 megahertz, and we're a little off there. So I'm gonna see what I can do about lining that up here. Let's see if I can back this up to about where it's supposed to be on 15, and see if we can adjust it with this pot here. Backing it up, but not much.
I think I'm gonna set it to 14 so I can get a little bit better reference. All right, we're on 14 megahertz. And that's about the closest I can get it right there. It won't go back any further, so I'm gonna peek this out too. Let me turn this gain down here. All right, and we have the time signal. They seem to be pretty dead on on short waves, so. We'll call that good enough. And it seems to be fairly sensitive on short wave. So that should be good, pretty well aligned on uh, on short wave. But the best I could do was what I did on these on the top band. It's not exact, but uh, it's about the best I'm gonna be able to get it. All right, I believe I, I believe I've done it. Got it pretty good. I believe I'm ready to go back and put it back in the cabinet. All right, here we go. I got it back in the cabinet. Do a band scan. Kind of amazing how much bigger the radio gets when it's in the cabinet. Cabinet, so on this thing, it's huge. And money, and you're gonna love Freedom Checks. You see, over the next few months, an estimated $34.6 billion is up for grabs to anyone who stakes their claim. Now, traffic and weather. From the Okanagan Traffic Center, if you were injured at work, call the attorneys at Okanagan 1-800-El Scopio. Highways back up to speed. Police responding to an accident on the inbound East Shoreway near MLK Drive. Also watch for a disabled vehicle in the left lane on the West Shoreway eastbound at East 9. Olivia Musica, News Radio, WTAM 1100, Total Traffic. Your Channel 3 forecast. This is the time. Price appetizers all week long after 9 p.m., including their world-famous crab dip, hog hammers, and chicken wings. Stop by and try the Green Turtle in North Wales, your new favorite sports bar and grill. Take charge of your health with Independence Blue Cross. Proud to be the local source. We only recommend the best CPAs and enroll. No matter who we 
are, or where we come from, we all experience difficulties in life. Light is interfering. If you're suffering from hearing loss, stay tuned for a special EWTN nightly in Washington, D.C. I'm Lauren Ashburn with an EWTN President Trump attends a black tie dinner kicking off. Bruce.com. Call 800 52 degrees and clear. I'm Lisa Ritchie with the stories you're talking about on 77 WABC. The Supreme Court has decided that it will stay out of the dispute concerning the DACA program. Correspondent Ariana DeVoe has more. The court has said it will not step into the DACA. Not uh, yet even identifying where he's at in that trench. The man was working in a trench about 10 feet down when the earthen walls fell in on him. It's believed the crew was working to find a water main in an abandoned part apartment complex that's been unused for years. The man wanted for a quadruple shooting on Detroit's west side died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. 27-year-old George Davis Jr. is believed to have shot three people, including his ex-girlfriend, at a gas station on Finkel. Commander Jacqueline Pritchard says Davis stole the car and then went to a house on Faust Street. To the relative's home, he goes inside to our state's economy and stick a finger in the eye of a huge employer in our state just to satisfy his buddies at the NRA. That, again, is from gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams. Right now, 56 degrees in Atlanta. Mostly clear skies tonight. Lows 41 to 45. Mostly sunny tomorrow. Um, even if I didn't have a weapon. Press Secretary Sarah Saunders suggested it was more of a comment about displaying leadership. Tomorrow, sunny, a high of 62. Wednesday, showers are likely a high of 57. That's the forecast from your Severe Weather Station, News Radio 700, WRW. Radar shows mostly clear skies in the tri-state. It's 53 degrees. There is some... Police center, but they do get back a couple of their injured players. Rondé Hollis... Seems to have pretty good low band reception. Not a whole lot on the lower part of the bands, but... It seems to, uh, you can hear the noise level. It's pretty good on it. There's 650 WSM. It's coming in good. Check out the shortwave bands. I don't know. Sounds like a lot of buzzing. Camera's about to die. Let me uh, let me stop the video for a second, recharge the camera. Okay, I'll let the camera charge. I'm back after about an hour. I think we left off here at about 5 megahertz. So. There is a uh, there is a light on this thing too. It's just uh kind of kind of on the dim side. Within three shots of eight and front nine, he plus with a 70 and finished the twelfth. In Formula One, Richard, fastest time on day one of Formula One's preseason testing in Spain. Rain and cold track temperatures, which dipped below seven degrees, kept most cars off the tarmac. The Australian braved poor weather conditions to become the only driver to reach the 100 lap mark. Uh, what's that? 
I can turn this light on without it bothering too many things. The picture looks kind of dark. <clears throat> Surprise, uh, Radio Havana Cuba isn't in here. Usually right around 6 megahertz. Alright, let's flip over to the, the top band. Wrong way. at night time so the upper bands are not going to be propagating very much but I'm um, picking up a little bit here Side band, there. Eh? Well, it's not the light interfering. a bunch of image frequencies. Nineteen thirty nine Fata model one sixty nine from nineteen thirty nine playing playing pretty good. All right, I believe this one will be good for a little quite a while longer, and uh, I believe I'm gonna uh, enjoy this one. I, I like uh, pre war tube, ra uh, well, pre war tube radios, but pre war wood wooden radios. So, um, thanks for watching.